pleasure to introduce friend and colleague, Gerard Benarut, who is going to speak about Spike PCA model. Thank you. Spike Tensor PCA. So of course it's a, a model, a question I alluded to in the, in the lecture I gave, the cross-program thing I gave on Monday. So let me remind you what the question is. So, can you read? So PCA means uh, principal component analysis, and I'm sure you know what it is for matrices. So the question here for tensor is the following. Let's, you fix a point N in the sphere, and we're in dimension N, so that's the unit sphere. And this point, you don't know it. It will be the spike. And this is what you want to, 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 to discover, but you're not given this point. You're given, given this, uh, uh, let me call it P. So you're given this, the tensor, the P tensor given by this vector. And so, it, of course, if you just had that, the problem is solved. But this tensor is, I mean, what you see is an, a noisy observation of this. To this, you add Z, which is a, a P tensor, which is a random P tensor. And to simplify, of course, you assume it to be um, uh, Gaussian and all the entries to be N01. Okay? So the question, so maybe now here you have a, a number, let's say alpha. This alpha will be the signal to noise ratio, right? So if alpha is zero, you have no signal. As alpha is large, then you can consider the noise is small. And the question is, you, you observe this, you want to understand n, you want to find n, right? So this is unknown. And you have this noisy version, and you want to denoise, right? So you want to understand n. So, and of course, the, 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 the signal to noise ratio will play a role. All right. So. The, the, the way you do that, so I won't, I won't spend much time on the statistics aspects of it, but w when you have this, in particular if this thing is Gaussian, the f you, you do of course a, a maximum likelihood estimator, and when you do that, maximum likelihood estimation, impose that you have in the end to what you want to find is the maximum of, let's say, u uh, times this thing. Um, so in the end, what, let, let me write it. In the end, what the maximum likelihood problem ends up doing is you have to find for the max for the U in the sphere, here the unit sphere, of alpha U inner product with the pole, N, uh, I call it N, yeah? N means, for me is the North Pole to the power P plus the sum of the coefficient, which I will, let me call them again JY1, JIP, of UI1, UIP. Well, these J's are in fact simply, the, I should call them Z, but they were called J in my, uh, I mean, any spin glass theory things or in the lecture I was given before. So, these are the coefficients of the tensor Z, right? Your tensor Z is just this matrix. Okay, for the moment, let me call it Z so that this is coherent. And so these guys are IID and N01. So the statistical ex estimation problem, the maximum likelihood end up being doing something like this, okay? And so the question is, how do you find this maximum? And can you? So the, 
So of course here I have a function, Let me call it phi of u. All right, so this function here is a random function, a random Gaussian function. on the sphere, and, and I may be interested in, the, so on this function, to understand its, what is the, its complexity. As I described in the lecture of Monday, I'll come back to that for those who are not here on Monday. So what is the complexity of this function? And what we'll see is that depending on the strength of the signal to noise, we will have three regions. One where the, um, you can recover the signal very well. So complexity is, is, uh, is not important. One where you cannot recover the signal at all, essentially, and the complexity beats everything. And one where you can recover a part of the signal, uh, and I will describe the complexity there. So before I go there, and this doesn't look like a random matrix model at all, of course, but so before I go there, let's, uh, there are two, sim two simpler cases that you may want to uh, understand. So what I will be describing here is joint work with uh, Michai Nika, uh, in the order, it's Andrea, Monta uh, yeah, Andrea Montanari, I'm trying to put the alphabetical order, Michai Nika, and Oh, and May, so the, Michai is third. All right, so two simpler cases. First, what happens when alpha equals zero? When you have no spike, when you have pure noise. Okay, so I'll come back to that. That I described a bit last time. And second, what happens when P is 2, which is much simpler. Right? When P is 2, this problem is the usual PCA. Usual PCA. OK, so because, let's look at what P2 means. So when P is 2, here you just have a quadratic form. Right? Or let's say here you have a matrix to which you add one spike. Okay, so this falls under the classical question now of understanding what happens, and now we have a random matrix. So this is well understood. So let me maybe start with this. So the question is, what happens here? The general question is, what happens for a random matrix? Because there, in, when p equal two, you have a random matrix plus a finite rank perturbation. Here, the, rank per the perturbation is of rank one. Right? So, this is, so what happens in particular for the spectrum? So this is, of course, in statistics, it's a typical. So let's say I have a random matrix M, properly normalized, and, I ha and I, let's say random, and I, and I add A, which is finite rank, say rank one or two this. So that's, of course, uh, the usual, the, it's called PCA in statistics when this is, in fact, when this matrix is, in fact, the sample covariance matrix of, of a sample. And you, and you have spike because you assume that your true covariance structure is flat with maybe one or two direction in which there is signal. Right? So PCA is this principal component analysis is too, very simple. You just look at the spectrum of this. You take the singular va values. You look at the spectrum of the Wishart matrix, and you try to see if you have uh, uh, some eigenvalues that get out of the spectrum. So this has been studied at length. So when this is a Wishart, in the Wishart case, but also in the Wigner case, so let's say this is a Wigner matrix, and this is a finite rank, let's say, for the moment, perturbation, deterministic, let's say rank one for the moment. And, and so the statistical question is, can you, you have two different questions, or, or in fact more. One question is of the type, which is, there are a lot of variants. I'm doing, I'm going a bit fast, but so that I just need that to be able to 
talk about it in the tensor case, you have detection and you have recovery. Two different questions. So detection is you observe this and you ask yourself, so AN has a, let's say it's one, a rank one matrix. If you want to think of sim something simple, think of AN to be, I don't know, Oh, I put an alpha, so let me put it here. Alpha would be just, AN would just be this matrix. Matrix is just rank one with the one here, for instance. Um, and you ask yourself, can I detect in what I observe, this noisy version of the, this, this thing, can I detect the spike? Can I make a difference between this and the case where alpha equals zero? Right? So that's detection, and there are different variants of de defining detection, but globally it means, can you detect in, uh, the signal, can you detect that there exists a signal? Right? And the recovery is, of course, and again you have weak, strong recovery. Recovery means, can you find the signal, or some approximation, some good approximation of the signal? Right? So, all that is... So uh, that's an example, you could do whatever. So all that is well understood. It goes back to, um, in the case of random matrices, to a paper by uh, Baik, myself, and Sandrine Péché, which is now old. I think it's 2006, which did that in the Wishart case and then has been expanded a lot uh, in all sorts of directions. On the random matrix side by uh, uh, Milen Maida, Sandrine Péché, of course, and uh, Catherine Donati-Martin, and, and others. Florent, uh, Benaïch Georges, and uh, Alice. And that's on the random matrix side. But of course, on the statistics side, this has become a complete industry. Uh, Maybe not with the kind of detail that we were obtaining there. So what was obtaining those things were things of this nature, of the following nature. When is it that the eigenvalue that you add, let's say, this finite rank thing, can get out of the semicircle? So for instance, detection means, for instance, if you see that you have one eigenvalue, if, you have, if alpha equals zero, you have a semicircle. And outside of the spectrum, outside of the semicircle, you find nothing, essentially. The outliers are, don't exist. So if you find an outlier, then you detect that something is happening. So the question is, when is it that uh, this thing imposes an eigenvalue outside of the semicircle? And this happens, in fact, when, so if this is the semicircle normalized with the usual radius of two, the usual semicircle, Unfortunately, all these papers are written with a radius of square root of two, but it's just a scaling. So this happens when alpha is larger than one. Okay, when alpha is larger than one, strictly you find an eigenvalue. The spectrum of this has an outlier. And so you can detect and in fact also recover. So in this case, so we, here, many things are studied. For instance, the fluctuation of this eigenvalue when it's outside of the spectrum, it's Gaussian. When it's in the critical regime, where it's close to one, uh, it's, a, it's a modified tracy widom fluctuation. And when it's smaller than one, you just don't find it. So in this case, in case of matrices, this is the case where p equal two, detection and recovery happen at the same threshold, which is one. And so you don't have what is called a statistical estimation gap. That is, when you can detect, you can recover. But in particular, in this literature, we will be using one important paper for us here, which is a paper by Maida in 2000, I forgot, six or seven, which obtained the large deviation principle for the top eigenvalue. So in this context, if you don't have a spike, right, just take a Wigner matrix, consider lambda 1. Uh, when I say Wigner here, I meant GOE, Gaussian. Uh, so take lambda 1, the top eigenvalue, 
of your GOE. So you know that lambda 1 is close to 2. You know that the fluctuations are tracy with them, but you may want to look at the large deviation principle. And this has been done a long time ago now by, uh, in a paper already about spin glasses by Amir Dembo, uh, Alice Guionnet, and myself. And where we obtain the large deviation principle for this thing, and the large deviation principle for that are simple. If you look at something like that, this will be of order exponential minus n, a certain function j of x, or I will call here L0 of x for future purposes, which is easy to describe. And if, on the contrary, you like try to understand what's happening if you want to go your x is positive. On the other side, of course, this will be, this is much more difficult, and it's in the rate n square, and it's another thing, which is i of x. All these functions, L0 and i, are completely explicit. So L0 is simply, maybe with a constant that I forget, integral to 2 to x of square root of 4 minus x2, x, x squared dx. All right, so that's the large deviation in the case where you have no spike. But when you have a spike, it's uh, way more delicate. So so when you have a spike, still, now, in the case of matrices, this is the result by Milen Maida. She gives a, an LDP for the top eigenvalue with a rate function, which is, which I will call L. Let me get her alpha or something. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, you, you mean it should be that. Yeah. OK, so there is a certain rate function that I won't describe. This, rate, this thing is a much more delicate thing than the, the result I just mentioned. This uses heavily um, former results by, uh, by uh, Alice Guillonet and uh, Ofer Zaytouni. Uh, which goes back to O2, I think. All right, so just, so of course, one way to, if, if I don't want this detailed information here, I could say that lambda 1 satisfies the large deviation principle in rate n. If I assume that, the, I, I simply say that the rate function when x is sm uh, negative, if you want here, is infinite. Because in fact, the real rate is n squared. So, that, that would be a, a way to, do, to, to state this. And Milan Maida gives this, uh, the equivalent result in this case. All right. So that's good. That's the case where, uh, for the usual PCA. The question is, um, and by the way, the location of this thing here is essentially alpha plus 1 over alpha. So you know where the, the spike is. So you can recover the strength of the spike too. All right, so that's all good, but that's this case where p equal 2. So in the case p equal 2, the idea that there is a random matrix, of course, is clear because we're looking at a random matrix. But now, what about alpha equal 0? So another example, which is well known, where p is larger than 3. So now we are. So remember what, the, what is the function we're looking at. So we have this function, which was alpha times um, x in a product with a, uh, a pole, whichever it is. Uh, and I had plus this uh, sum of ji1 ip, xi1 xip. And the J's are IAD and 0, 1. 
So now I want to I, I get rid of this. So for the moment, I take the case where alpha equals zero, so I'm just looking at this thing. So this thing is just what I was talking about on Monday. This is just, if you want, one way to look at it is just a, a random polynomial, homogeneous polynomial of degree three restricted to the sphere. The best way to describe its distribution it's to say that this is a, a Gaussian field, a Gaussian function, centered here when, when alpha equals zero, uh, and covariance given simply, if you make it, it's a very simple computation, if you compute the covariance of this at two different points of the sphere, you find that this is just the inner product of x and x prime to the p. So this describes, if you want, this is, an alt this is description one, this is description two of the same object. So now I have this random Gaussian function, and I want to understand, say something about it. How difficult is it to uh, find its minimum, or here I was, or its maximum? So this is what I was describing on Monday. The complexity of this is well understood now. So for, of course, for the way to describe this as a physicist, it's a, simply the p-spin spherical model. In the physics uh, models, instead of putting it on the unit sphere, it's on the sphere of radius square root of n, but it's the same thing. All right, so one way to study it, there are essentially two ways to look at this uh, function and understand how hard it is to find its minimum or detect if there is a spike or not. For the moment, I don't put any spike. So one way is, of course, the physics way is to introduce, it, is to introduce the Gibbs measure and a positive temperature. So you look simply at the measure of mu, let's say G, like Gibbs, and beta dx on the sphere, which is simply exponential minus beta phi of x, dx normalized. And then you want what you do when you're a physicist, you want to understand the first question you ask is the free energy. Of course, this the end depends on the temperature beta, which is try to understand the limit of 1 over n log Zn. And the second thing is try to understand the behavior, the asymptotic behavior of the Gibbs measure itself. And in particular, so this is, I mean, in physics literature and now in the math literature, this is understood. So there is, so I, I would be fast on that. There is a formula for this thing, we have a variational formula, which is called the Parisi formula. I won't describe it. And there's also an understanding of the Gibbs measure, which I will describe very briefly, which is if you take two points, let's put it this way, if you, if you sample two points under the Gibbs measure uh, at high temperature when beta is small, which is not what we're interested in here, then essentially this, uh, these two points behave as if you were sampling them from the uniform distribution on the sphere. Which means that if you look, for instance, at their overlap, that is their inner product, it's essentially zero. Whereas if you do the same thing when beta is large at low temperature, you have a, f so what I described here is what the physicists call the replica symmetric phase. When beta is large at low temperature, you have a one RSB phase so that's replica symmetric phase versus one RSB phase, which I will describe very briefly. If you take two points under the Gibbs measure, their inner product, or if you want their distance, take essentially two values, two possible values. Either they are orthogonal, the two points, zero, or the, 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 they are at a definite distance, which depends on beta. This is coherent with the idea you should think of it as you have clusters of, uh, the, the Gibbs measure is carried by clusters of, uh, of points around points which are orthogonal. So if you take two points in the same cluster, they will have a certain definite distance. In two different clusters, they will be orthogonal. But that's what, in a nutshell, that w what we know. 
But now here, what we're, we're interested in was what happens at zero temperature, which is beta equals infinity. So as a physicist, for instance, if you want to find the minimum of this function, what you can do is just take the, or even as a mathematician, you take this, you take the free energy, and you divide it by beta, and you let beta go to infinity, and this should go to the minimum. And it's a fact. It's true. So that's one way to discover the minimum of this function. Another way, which is what I was describing, is to understand the complexity of the function. So one way to do that, so directly at temperature zero. So without introducing the Gibbs measure, and one way to do that is to understand the number of critical points. So I would call crit k of u, it's the number of critical points of my function phi with index k and such that phi of x is smaller than u. Here, because of the normalization, it will be square root of n u. Okay, so you look at the critical points at a given level. And here I fix the index, remember it's the number of negative eigenvalues of the Hessian. And you may want to understand the, this mean number of critical points. This is a random number, of course. And this, as I explained, through the katz rice formula, is linked to a random matrix model problem. is not equal, is related to a random matrix problem, which I will describe very quickly. This thing is simply the integral on the sphere of the expectation of the absolute value of the determinant of the Hessian of phi indicator of index at point x equal k, conditioned by the fact that phi is, that x is critical, that the value is V, and then you integrate against the density, let's say G of U zero du dx. And here you integral, integral uh, V, you integrate between negative infinity and U. Okay, that's the formula. The important thing is that you have here the Hessian and its absolute value. And then the link with random matrix is that, in fact, as is easy to find, the Hessian of this function, this Hessian, conditioned by the fact that the function is critical and by the value of the function. So the law of this is, in fact, the law of a GOE in dimension n minus 1 shifted by a constant which depends on P, V by the identity. So that's the real link. That's what the Katz-Rice formula is good for. This is a link between a random function problem and a random matrix problem. And so obviously the Hessian is, is a random matrix. It's a random Gaussian symmetric real matrix. And it happened that in this context, because this field is isotropic, as you can see in this formula, the covariance only depends on the distance, uh, it happened that in fact this matrix, this Hessian, is the GOE. So if you apply this basic fact, this counting problem becomes a problem in random matrix. And what, what do you have to understand? You have to understand the expectation. So what is needed here at the core of this formula, it's the expectation of the absolute value of the determinant of a GOE minus a constant times the identity. That is, you have to understand the absolute value of the characteristic polynomial of a GOE in, in, in some detail. So this has been done, and in this work, so this, was, this was started in the work by uh, Tukau, Finger, myself, and Cherny, and then there were many other papers. And in particular, recent papers by Eliran Subag and Subag and Zetouni, which, are, which push this, this work much further. Let me tell you what we learned. So we learned that the, this 
uh, uh, function is exponentially complex, we learn that this number of critical points, I will concentrate on the minima here, is exponentially large. So from there, you find that the limit of the expectation of the number of critical points of index zero below a level u, index zero means local minima. Uh, I'm sorry, I need a log. This limit exists and is a certain function, theta zero of u, which you can compute explicitly in terms of the large deviation principle that I mentioned before, and this function has this shape. You have, in particular, this function is positive somewhere, and this uh, indicates that there should be a, an exponentially large number of critical points of a local minima, and there are. And in fact, Subag improved this by proving that the, that the, the second moment behaves like twice this, so in fact, he was able to prove that this number of critical points normalized by its mean essentially goes to one. So the mean, the, mean number, the, the mean gives you the right order of magnitude. So let me summarize what we know now. With, when you have no spike, this function is uh, very complex. It has an enormous number of exponentially large number of local minima, which are all very low. So again, if you try to find a minimum, remember we had to find a maximum, but everybody can put a negative sign, and that would be the same problem. If you want to find the, the minimum, you will be blocked by, this, uh, by these uh, local minima with any reasonable algorithm. Now the question is, after these two simple facts, simple cases, what happens when you really have a spike? So now, when alpha is non-zero and p is not two, right? So we have to mix these two things. Then the result that we have is that, in fact, we can compute. So this is a theorem, which is due to the four authors I mentioned, that the limit of one over n log of the mean number of critical points of index k, and we can do something very precise. So let me maybe, so, okay, I'm trying to draw a sphere in dimension n, which is not easy. So I will, here is my north pole. This is the thing I want to find. This is the equator. So here I will fix uh, an altitude, if you want, z, a latitude z. So z is between zero, which correspond to the equator, and one, which correspond to the North Pole. And I will look at the parallel here. And I will look at this 